Exodus chapter 11. Now, this morning we hope to take a rather large section of scripture. And so there's going to be some extended passages where I just read the biblical text and make little comment on it, maybe just a few comments. And so I'm, I'm hoping that right now you're sitting in front of you with a Bible open or turned on and selected to the right place. I know many of you use electronic Bibles. By the way, which is fine, except the problem with the electronic Bibles is that it doesn't give that sound of page turning, <laughs> which is so precious to the heart of any pastor. That's like the most beautiful sound in the world because it shows people have brought their Bibles and they're ready to, to read and to learn. You, you got the app that, that brings the page turning sound. Thank you. We'll recommend that to everybody. Dude. So let, let's just sort of immerse ourselves in the wonder and the glory of the text. Because I don't need to remind you that the text itself is more wonderful than anything that I have to say about it. And the goodness of anything that I say, it, it should just be drawn out of the text and to explain it itself. So we come to the story of the children of Israel who after some 400 years of bondage and slavery in Egypt, were now on the threshold of being set free from all of that. But, but there was at least one great obstacle in the way. It was the hardened, obstinate heart of Pharaoh. He would not let them go. And even though God struck the Egyptians with nine terrible, severe plagues, Pharaoh continued to harden his heart until now God is going to unleash the 10th and the final plague upon them. And that's our text this morning, or our general theme. Exodus chapter 11, beginning now at verse 1. And the Lord said to Moses, I will bring yet one more plague on Pharaoh and on Egypt. Afterwards, he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will surely drive you out of here altogether. Speak now in the hearing of the people and let every man ask from his neighbor and every woman from her neighbor articles of silver and articles of gold. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. Did you see that in verse three, friends? It says very plainly for us there that the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. This means that even though Pharaoh was not yet quite convinced that he should let the people of the Lord go, nevertheless, the people of Egypt understood and they were so beaten down by these severe plagues that they were actually happy to see them go. Do you wanna know how happy they were? That they gave them articles of silver and gold and jewelry and precious vessels. Now keep that in mind because we're gonna meet up with some of those precious things later on in the text of Exodus. But ladies and gentlemen, they, they paid them to go. They bribed them to go. Please, would you leave, people of Israel? Now, nobody should think this was unfair. Nobody should think this was extortion of any kind. I'll tell you what this was. This was back wages. Israel had served without recompense for, for hundreds of years, and now they were being justly rewarded and probably not even up to the full measure of the work that they did for the Egyptians. But God was arranging it so where they would receive some kind of just recompense, recompense, I should say, as they made their way out of Egypt. Now, verse 4. Then Moses said, Thus says the Lord, About midnight I will go out in the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the female servant who sits behind the hand mill, and all the firstborn of the animals. Then there shall be a great cry throughout the land of Egypt, such as was not like it before, nor shall be like it again. But against none of the children of Israel shall a dog move its tongue, against man or beast, that you may know that the Lord does make a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. And all these your servants shall come down to me and bow down to me, saying, Get out, and all the people who follow you. After that, I will go out. Then he went out from Pharaoh in great anger. You see, the Lord did this, verse 7 says, that you may know that the Lord makes a difference between the Egyptians and the Israelites. Isn't this what a lot of them failed to recognize? Oh, God of Egypt, God of Israel, what's the big difference? It's all just out there and God this, God that. God says, no, 
I'm going to show them that there is a difference, that there's a vast difference, that there's a grand canyon's worth of difference or more between these false figment of your imagination, gods of the Egyptian uh, deities, and the Lord God of Israel who reigns in heaven. Verse 9, But the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will not heed you, so that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. So Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the children of Israel go out of his land. Ladies and gentlemen, Pharaoh's hardening his heart again. Something bad's going to happen. I want you to think about it, about the multiplied calamity of all the nine plagues that have gone before. All nine of the plagues. They've all come upon Israel, and some of them have touched the household, or at least the property of Pharaoh in some way or another. But he hardened his heart. It's as if God shouted at him again and again, let me have your attention, Pharaoh, let me have it. And he just made his heart harder and harder and more calloused, up to the point now where the callous is going to bring catastrophe. Verse 1, now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, this month shall be the beginning of your months. It shall be the first month of the year to you, speaking in all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth day of the month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. I like what God did, first of all, in verse 2 of chapter 12. He pushed a great big reset button for Israel. He said, you have a new New Year's. You have a new first month. And this first month is going to mark your deliverance from Egypt. Now, sometimes it can get complicated because the Israelites had a ceremonial calendar and they had a civil calendar. And sometimes those things don't exactly match up. But nevertheless, get this point. God was saying, I want you to start time anew with this deliverance that I bring with this next thing that's going to come upon Pharaoh and Egypt. It was a dramatic way of saying, now everything changes. And I just want you to think of that for a moment. That there comes a point in a person's life, a critical marking point, and sometimes God in his goodness may give you a few marking points where everything changes, and it changes for the better. Where a person goes from bondage to freedom. Where they go from guilty to innocent. Where they go from stained to now they stand righteous and approved. That's the kind of transformation that was on the way for Israel. But it had to do with something that God began to describe there in verse 3 of Exodus 12. Did you notice it? It says, every man shall take for himself a lamb. On the 10th of this first month, each household was to take a lamb, and that lamb was to live with the family for four days until Passover. On the 10th day of this month, until the 14th day of the same month. I want you to notice a few things. First of all, bring the little lamb into your household. Wasn't that sweet? The little lamb pet there for the household. And I suppose four days is not too short a time for that lamb to sort of become attached to the people in the household. It becomes a bit of a pet lamb in four days, doesn't it? But that just makes it all the more significant when we understand what's going to happen to that lamb that's been received into the household. I want you to notice something else, too, that God commanded that this be done by families. And isn't that something special about what it says about God's desire, God's great plan for our families? God didn't say a lamb for each individual. He, he didn't say a lamb for the nation. He wanted this done by families. And remind yourself, there was no temple. There was no tabernacle. There was no priest. There wasn't even a formal altar. But each family had to do its own business before God. And there they are gathered together before him, bringing the lamb into the home. But it had to be a special lamb. Did you see what it said in verse 5? Your lamb shall be without blemish. The lamb was also to be pure and without any mar. It was to be the best lamb you could find. 
The sacrifice unto the Lord had to be the best lamb that one could be. Now verse 7. And they shall take some of the blood. Wait a minute, wait a minute. One minute, we're talking about a lamb. The next minute, we're talking about blood. Where did the blood come from? From that sweet pet lamb that you brought into the household. Lichem, this, this strikes, does it not? That God said this thing that's dear, this thing that's beloved, this, this creature that is innocent. If you had four days to get acquainted with that lamb, you'd know that it hadn't done anything wrong, that it itself was innocent. That sweet little lamb, all of a sudden now, without even God specifically saying to kill it, now it's spoken of as his blood. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts of the lintel of the house where they eat it. And they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire, with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw, nor boiled at all with water, but roasted in fire, its head and its legs and its entrails. You shall let none of it remain until morning. And what remains of it until morning you shall burn with fire, and you shall eat it with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, so you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. You take that pet lamb, you slaughter it, you butcher it. I, I don't know any more polite way to put it. You slaughter it, you butcher it, you gather its blood. And what does it say in verse 7? You take some of the blood and put it on the do, door, two doorposts and on the lintel of the house. On either side and up top, you splash the blood. And as we're going to find out later, they did it with a hyssop branch. They dipped a hyssop branch in the basin of blood from that sweet little lamb. And they put it on either side and up on the top. Before the Passover lamb could be eaten, its blood had to be applied to the doorway of the house. And ladies and gentlemen, how bloody. What a strange place to put the blood. That you'd see it every time you walked in and out of the house. It wasn't in some obscure place. God wanted the blood of that lamb to be prominent, to be visible. But then he said this, verse 11, and you shall eat it. The lamb could be eaten or must be eaten, but only if it had been roasted in fire with the lamb itself coming into contact with the fire and bitter herbs accompanying the meal. And then verse 10 says, you let none of it remain until morning. You eat all of it. All of it. You, you can't pick and choose. You can say, well, I, I, like the, you know, I like the lamb chops. That's what I want. The other parts of the lamb, I don't like that. No, no. You take the whole thing. You take it all, or you don't take any of it. Notice what it says there in verse 11. It is the Lord's Passover. The Passover was the Lord's in the sense that he provided it. And he provided it, number one, as a rescue to deliver Israel from the plague of the firstborn. Ladies and gentlemen, let me cut to the chase. We're going to read about it in a moment, but I'm so excited. I can't hold back on this. Let me tell you what's going to happen in Egypt. An angel of destruction. The destroyer is going to sweep through the land of Egypt and upon every household that does not have the blood of the lamb on the doorpost and on the lintel, every one of those homes is going to be visited by destruction and the firstborn in that home shall die. Number one, that blood, that sacrifice, that Passover was God's appointed rescue from the destruction that was about to come upon the firstborn of Egypt. But number two... God gave it as an institution to remember God's rescue and deliverance throughout every generation. But then number three, it is a powerful drama. The sacrifice of the Passover lamb and the application of its blood and the eating of its meat is all a dramatic and powerful drama acting out the perfected sacrifice and rescue that Jesus the Messiah would later perform for us. You say, well, that's great. You know, you're just looking for wonderful illustrations of the work of Jesus. This isn't my initiative. This is a theme so strong, it's repeated multiple times in the New Testament. By the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul made it very clear. Listen carefully. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. 
For indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Christ our Passover. And then we have what John the Baptist said when he saw Jesus come to be baptized. Do you remember what John the Baptist saw? He said this, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. There is indication, according to John 19, 14, and some of this chronology is, is controversial and people, in, but there is indication that Jesus was actually crucified on the Passover. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus is the Passover lamb. Doesn't this fill out so beautifully? He lived with and he became bonded to the human family ever before he was sacrificed for them. And the sacrifice of Jesus had to be appropriated to each and every home. It simply wasn't given on a national or a community basis. Jesus, our Passover lamb, is spotless, perfectly sown, not stained by any sin, no moral or spiritual imperfection whatsoever. And it was only the blood of Jesus, his actual poured out sacrifice, his life given for you and me on the cross. That is what atoned for sin. And even in the death of Jesus, he was touched with fire, the fire of God's judgment upon the cross. I say this respectfully. I hope it doesn't sound shocking in anybody's ears. But ladies and gentlemen, there's a sense in which Jesus was roasted on the cross. He was touched by the fires of God's judgment, even as the Passover lamb was. In his death, Jesus received the bitter cup of God's judgment, even having a sponge lifted up to him by a branch of hyssop. And the work of Jesus has to be received fully, with none of it in reserve. We take all of Jesus, not just the parts that please us. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to sit down at this Passover meal with Jesus being your Passover lamb, with him being your rescue, as the angel of judgment passes over, here's what you've got to do. You've got to eat all of them. You've got to say, okay, Jesus, all of you. Not just the parts that please you, not just the parts that are convenient, but all of Jesus. You need to receive him and latch on to him. And the Passover work of Jesus for his people is the dawn, it's the prelude to their freedom. Ladies and gentlemen, no wonder that the Passover blood was applied to the top and to each side of the doorway. Its blood dripped down. It formed a figure of the cross in each and every doorway, a bloody cross on the doorways of Israel. We'll look at the protection it provided here now in verse 12. God says, for I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. They should have to be spared the judgment of the firstborn. They had to apply the blood just as God told them to. The blood of the lamb was essential to what God required. Egyptian, Israelite, it didn't matter. When God sent the destroyer to the house, all he looked for was the blood on the household. And I just want you to imagine in your mind for a moment that there's an Israelite who says, oh, this is an archaic custom, such a bloody work. Who needs to pay attention to it? I won't do it at all. You know, I'll just have a lamb chop for dinner. That's all that really matters. And he didn't do anything that God told him to do. Ladies and gentlemen, what would be the tragic result in that home? They would suffer the death of the firstborn. And the, well, I'm an Israelite. I belong to these people. God said, no, but you didn't avail yourself of the protection of the Passover lamb and its blood. And then I see in my mind an Egyptian family, an Egyptian family who hears of what's going to happen. And the Egyptian family says, listen, I don't want my firstborn to perish. I'm going to do this exactly as the Israelites have been commanded to do. I will trust in the Passover lamb and its blood that protects. And that Egyptian family does it, and they are spared the judgment upon the firstborn. You see, it wasn't about how good you were, how bad you were. It wasn't about how smart you were, how not smart you were. It wasn't about family heritage or it was about national connection. It wasn't about any of those things. It was about a demonstrated trust in the blood of the Passover lamb. 
Verse 14. So this day shall be to you a memorial. And you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day there shall be a holy convocation, and on the seventh day there shall be a holy convocation for you. No manner of work shall be done on them, but that which every one must eat, that only may be prepared by you, so that you may observe the feast of unleavened bread. For on the same day I will have brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you shall observe this day throughout your generations as an everlasting ordinance. In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month, at evening, you shall eat the unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month at evening. For seven days, no unleavened bread shall be found in your houses, since whoever eats what is leavened, that same person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he's a stranger or a native of the land. You shall eat nothing leavened. In all your dwellings, you shall eat unleavened bread. It's just sort of a long stretch, isn't it? And if you were following along with me, you kind of sense this thing repetitive. Didn't you feel about halfway through that extended section that I read that you should almost say, all right, I get it, no leavened bread. Why do you have to repeat it about three or four times? I get it. But for these seven days, beginning with Passover and the seven days following, no unleavened bread. Okay, got it. You don't need to nag me about it. But this is it. He does need to nag us about it. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible is filled with pictures and one of the pictures in the Bible that's, that's prominent throughout is the picture of leaven or yeast being a picture of sin and corruption. Do you see what God was saying? When I rescue you, when I bring you out of Egypt, I want you to walk clean after that. I want you to live clean after your deliverance from Passover. Listen, this is very important. Would you please notice the order, the order? First, you are delivered and set free by the blood of the Passover lamb. Then you should live your life without leaven, without sin. Isn't this fascinating? It's not turned around. The way some people receive it is they think, okay, I'll clean up my life. I'll clean out the leaven or the sin in my life. Then God will accept me and deliver me. God says, no, that's not how it works at all. I will deliver you. I'll set you free by the blood of the Passover lamb. But then, then I want you to walk right. And this was a very important order and ordinance to the Lord God. That's why he says, so you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread on this same day when I have brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Now, one more thing before I go on to verse 21. Some people suggest that there was also a hygienic aspect in getting rid of the leaven. You know, we're going to get later on in the book of Exodus into so many details of the law of God. But one of the reasons God gave his law to Israel was for hygienic purposes. So that they would be clean, so that they would enjoy good hygiene, even with the poor infrastructure of the ancient world. And there was a hygienic process to the command to get rid of all the leaven. Because in those days, do you know how they leavened things? How they put yeast into bread? Was they made it like we would make sour, uh, sourdough bread today. You take a pinch of the old lump and you put it in the new. That's how you do it. Now, the problem with that is that if you keep that same lump going for an extended period of time, a lot of bacteria, a lot of corruption, maybe disease-causing things can get in there. So it's smart to once a year clean everything out and start all over anew. Even within this command that has so much spiritual significance, God kind of snuck in a great thing for the health and goodness of Israel. It just shows us how beautiful obedience is. Look, obey God and it'll go better for you in your life. I mean, it's just pretty much that simple. Obey God and things will be better. Anyway, verse 21. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, 
Pick out and take lambs for yourselves according to your families and kill the Passover lamb. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood that's in the basin, and strike the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning, for the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, then the Lord will pass over the door and not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to strike you. Verse 24, then you shall observe this thing as an ordinance for you and your sons forever. It will come to pass when you come into the land which the Lord shall give you as he has promised that you shall keep this service and it shall be when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service that you say, it is the Passover sacrifice of the Lord who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians and delivered our household. Did you see that, ladies and gentlemen? In verse 24, an ordinance for you and your sons forever. This deliverance of Passover was not only for them, but for their children and all generations to follow. And Passover uh, communicated the greatest work of redemption performed on the Old Testament side of the cross. Over and over again, God reminds Israel, I'm the Lord God who brought you out of Egypt. I brought you out of Egypt. That was his great work of deliverance. And now Passover, having been performed in the Old Testament and having been remembered by generation after generation of observant Jewish people, we also find it fulfilled in the person and work of Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus gave a new Passover, saying that his work on the cross was not only for that generation that he lived in, but should be remembered and applied through all generations. And Jesus reinterpreted the basic elements of Passover. He was the lamb. He provided the bread. Here was the cup. And he said these basic elements of Passover, here they are now given to you in a new covenant. You see how strongly it is that God proclaims Jesus is the new Passover that we understand and receive. Now let's pick it up in the middle of verse 27. So the people bowed their heads and worshipped. Then the children of Israel went away and did so, just as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. Notice first, they bowed their heads and worshipped. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the proper response towards what God promises us in Jesus, our Passover. He promises to rescue you, to deliver you, to pass over when his judgment is brought forth. He promises to deliver you and set you out on a new life. He promises to set you out without the leaven of the old, but on a new life, live pure and clean unto him. This is God's great promise. What's our response to that? Well, we believe it, we receive it, just as Israel did. I love those words there in verse 28, where it says, then the children of Israel went away and did so. They did it. They actually did what God told them to do. And what did they do in the whole case? They worshiped. They worshiped the Lord who did this for them. Now, I approach verse 29 with great pain of heart, because when you take the Bible seriously, ladies and gentlemen, I'll put it to you this way. I, I often stand before you and say that when I read the Bible, it's like a movie uh, running in my head. And usually that movie's wonderful. It really is. I mean, there's Jesus doing his work, and there's Jesus preaching, and there's Moses with the staff and, and coming out of Egypt, and it's a wonderful movie. But let's face it, when you take the Bible seriously and let its events play out in reality, sometimes it's sobering and terrible. Verse 29, and it came to pass at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of the livestock. So Pharaoh rose in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt for there was not a house where there was not one dead. Ladies and gentlemen, verse 29 tells us something terrible, that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. And I can't read that line and think about the terrible implications of how it played out without thinking of how many warnings God gave to Pharaoh. 
Didn't God give warning after warning to Pharaoh and all of Egypt? Didn't God do everything to persuade them to avert this terrible destruction? Oh, now listen, we, we could stand back and we'd say, oh, how terrible of God to do such a thing. What a terrible God. What a horrible God. Ladies and gentlemen, I see in this the necessary judgment of God preceded by his unbelievable mercy. How long was God under any obligation to contend with Pharaoh to try to persuade him? But he did it again and again and again. And it was only in the face of Pharaoh's cement-like hardened heart that God finally said, here it comes. I'll give you what I said would come. And the terrible result of it, verse 30, so Pharaoh rose in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt. So now he broke his will, and there was a great cry in Egypt. I find it fascinating that Exodus chapter 2, verse 23, Israel cried to God for deliverance. And the Egyptians made them do that. Pharaoh made Israel cry to God for deliverance. And then in Exodus chapter 5, verse 15, Israel cried to Pharaoh for relief. The oppression of Pharaoh made Israel cry again. Israel cried again and again. And now God says, now, Pharaoh, you're going to cry. You've made others cry. You've made others wail in agony. You've been heartless towards their suffering and their eventually death. Now, God says, now, Pharaoh, you're going to do the crying. Verse 31. Then he, meaning Pharaoh, then he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise, go out from among my people, both you and the children of Israel, and go serve the Lord as you have said. Also take your flocks and your herds as you've said, and be gone, and bless me also. And the Egyptians urged the people that they might send them out of the land in haste. For they said, we shall all be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, having their kneading bowls bound up in their clothes and on their shoulders. Now the children of Israel had done according to the word of Moses. And they had asked from the Egyptians articles of silver, articles of gold and clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they granted them what they requested. Thus they plundered the Egyptians." Did you see what Pharaoh said in verse 31? Rise and go out from among my people. Moses came to Pharaoh months before. I don't know how exactly how many months, but months before. And he looked Pharaoh in the eye and he said, Thus says the Lord, let my people go. And what did Pharaoh say? No, no, repeatedly no, no. Now, just as the Lord predicted, Pharaoh is pushing Israel out. Pharaoh is demanding that they go because finally, having been bent to the will of God, he can do no other. But did you notice what he said right before he left there? Verse 32. You saw that, didn't you? Where Pharaoh cried out and he said, Bless me also. This shows that now Pharaoh knew who the Lord was. Before, I didn't respect the Lord. I don't recognize you. I don't respect you. Who's Yahweh to me? I don't even care about Yahweh. Now, he cares. And he looks at Moses straight in the eye. He says, Moses, would you please bless me? I recognize that you and the God you serve are greater than I and any of our gods of the Egyptians. Please bless me also. Ladies and gentlemen, on that day, a terrible tragedy swept through the land of Egypt over every home that did not put their trust in the Passover sacrifice. And now I simply ask you, will you put your trust in God's Passover sacrifice? Now listen, I'm not trying to say for a moment that, that I'm predicting some calamity that will come upon your life. Listen, I, I'm, this work of the plagues was unique. And even though God may or may not do things like this by analogy, I can say this with great certainty. You and I and all of us, we need to trust in God's Passover sacrifice. You need to trust in it because there will be one day a judgment. And do you want to be spared that judgment? Do you want God to pass over you in judgment? Or do you want him to linger upon you in judgment? I'll take Passover, thank you very much. It only happens by 
doing what God said to do with the blood of the Lamb. Here is the atoning work of Jesus on the cross offered to you, and you can accept it or reject it. But ladies and gentlemen, if you decide to reject it, what possible excuse do you have? Has it not been explained to you clearly enough? God gave all these things in his word and through the mouth of a weak preacher to, to give it to you the best you can. I think you've had it explained to you clearly enough. You can certainly never stand before him on that day and say, I don't know. But then secondly, secondly, it's not just that you would be passed over for judgment. It's that you'd be set free. Passover was not just for the sake of Passover. Passover was for the sake of launching Israel out on freedom, glorious freedom. And we're going to be talking about that in the weeks ahead in the book of Exodus. And it's thrilling. Forget about Egypt. Let's look ahead to the promised land. And that's what God says to you. He has freedom for you. But thirdly, it's a freedom that walks unleavened. Pure. Free from sin. And this, this is a challenge to some in this very room. I don't know if you've noticed, but around you up front and towards the back in a couple of places, we have tables of communion set up, and there's bread broken, and there's a cup. Ladies and gentlemen, how could we go through this message today and not receive the table of the Lord? But we're going to do it a little bit different. Instead of passing the trays where each individual comes up, we want you to sense the community of it all. And we want you to be active and to come up and to take that piece of bread and dip it in the cup. And you can either linger up by the, the front here if you want or go back to your seat and partake of it. I will say this. If you are willing to receive this in faith, saying, Jesus, be my Passover lamb and all that it entails. If you are willing to receive it in faith, you are welcome at the table of the Lord. But ladies and gentlemen, if you're not willing to receive it in faith with an attitude of surrender and repentance before God, yet full of faith, then please, I say this respectfully, please stay in your seat. This is for us to receive. So would you please, this morning, prepare your heart to receive Jesus, your Passover lamb. Father in heaven, we're amazed at your goodness. We know, Lord, just as surely as Israel of old knew, we know that judgment is coming. And Father, when we read and listen to the news of the day and the news of this world, we think that that judgment may be coming sooner rather than later. It's in times like this that we especially cannot fool ourselves about life in the here and now and about eternity. So Jesus, we look to you as our Passover lamb, innocent, befriended, spotless, touched by the fire of God's judgment, Blood poured out, even by hyssop upon us. Jesus, we receive not, not your literal blood, but your literal death on our behalf as a substitute for us, just as that lamb died as a substitute for the firstborn in every household. Prepare us now to receive it. I pray, God, that you'd make this this partaking of communion, especially meaningful to so many here, that they would trust in you, knew that, that people would be set free, that guilty hearts would be cleansed, that impure lives would be set on a new direction, that freedom would reign in lives. Do it for your glory, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.